Hey y'all, Brandon here. I just wanted to let you know that this episode is a little more grim than usual, as we describe a pretty vicious crime that involves both violence against children as well as sexual abuse. So if that's a little too heavy for you, feel free to skip this week. But I also want to tell you about an upcoming event. This summer, over the weekend of July 11th and 12th, Brianne and I will be at the True Crime Podcast Festival in Kansas City, along with over 50 other of your favorite indie podcasts. If you want to come out, early registrations are already open over at truecrimepodcastfestival.com. That's truecrimepodcastfestival.com. And if you apply our special listener's code, GOTHIC, at checkout, you'll receive a 10% discount. That's truecrimepodcastfestival.com, and the code is GOTHIC. We hope to see you there. In 1930, Columbia Records released a single titled The Murder of the Lawson Family. The record, written by Walter Kidd Smith, a North Carolina singer-songwriter, was performed by the Carolina Buddies, featuring Smith on vocals, Posey Rohrer on fiddle, Buster Carter on banjo, and Louis McDaniel on guitar. The recording became a hit, selling over 8,000 units in spite of the gruesome events described in its lyrics. Walter Kidd Smith's song is a murder ballad one in the tradition that originated in England and Scotland during the mid-17th century. These compositions were unique in that they utilized narrative lyrics to describe gruesome and shocking real-world events. Of course, as settlers from these regions came to America, the genre evolved, and the isolated Appalachian region where many of these men landed, provided particularly fertile ground for these tales. But murder ballads were more than just entertainment. Behind the horrific lyrics of these songs were actual events that occurred. And the murder of the Lawson family and the Carolina Buddies record described one of the South's most gruesome. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. The winter of 1929 was harsh in Stokes County, North Carolina, with deep snowfall and a bitter cold that arrived prior to Christmas. And it was through this snow and cold that the Lawson family, headed by Charles and his wife Fanny, traveled into town to purchase new clothing and have a family portrait taken. This excursion into town would have been a significant expense for a rural working class family like the Lawsons, who had seven children from 17 years to four months in age. Exactly what Charlie Lawson's financial circumstances were is unknown, although he had saved enough money to buy his own property two years prior and was later described in an associated press wire as a quote, well-to-do farmer. So it's uncertain as to whether this visit into town was a pre-holiday indulgence that could be afforded or a grasp for something that would typically be outside of their financial capabilities. But the events that transpired on the following Christmas day put a much different perspective on this excursion. 
as it would later be seen as evidence that Charlie Lawson had premeditated the grisly murder of his entire family. From all appearances, Christmas morning in the Lawson cabin transpired as it was supposed to. It wasn't until the afternoon when chaos and death rang out. Carrie and Maybell Lawson, 12 and 7 years old respectively, set out from the family cabin towards their aunt and uncle's home. But unknown to the girls, their father, Charlie, was waiting in the tobacco barn. As they came within distance, he fired at them with a 12-gauge shotgun, and to ensure that both his daughters were indeed dead, he proceeded to bludgeon their bodies. Then, possibly to hide the evidence of what he had done, Charlie moved them into the barn. It's unknown if Fanny Lawson was aware of the violence at that moment, but as her husband left the barn to return the cabin, she was in fact standing on the porch where she became the next victim of Charlie and his shotgun. Inside the home was Marie, the eldest child at 17 years old. Marie, it is said, screamed at the sound of the shotgun blast that killed her mother, before quickly proceeding to push her younger brothers into finding a spot to hide. But when Charlie entered the cabin, Marie was the first to die. Next were young James, who was four years old, and Raymond at two years. Sources defer on exactly how they were killed. Some say they were solely bludgeoned to death, while others say that they too had been shot first. Gruesomely, the last Lawson child to fall victim to their father was the youngest, infant Mary Lou, who was only four months old. In rural North Carolina, of the 1920s, rabbit hunting was a fairly common Christmas tradition. So if any neighbors had heard the gunshots that killed the Lawson family, they likely took little notice. But this tradition is also what allowed Charlie and Fanny's eldest son, Arthur, to be the sole surviving family member at 16 years old. As that Christmas day, Arthur was in town purchasing ammunition while his family was slaughtered. It's unclear whether he had been sent to town as an errand by his father, or if the trip had been his own idea, but nevertheless, it saved his life. The horrific events were not discovered until later that afternoon, when relatives arrived to wish the family a Merry Christmas. But instead, what they found were the bodies of their beloved. The cabin rooms were blood-soaked and in complete disarray. And eerily, Charlie Lawson had positioned the bodies of his victims at rest with their hands across their chests and their heads resting on pillows. The two girls in the tobacco barn were laid out with rocks beneath their heads. After killing his family, Charlie Lawson retreated into the nearby woods. He carried two shotguns with him and was accompanied by the family's dogs. Evidence found at the scene indicated that he had stopped to wash his bloody hands in a creek, and based on footprints, it was believed that he likely paced around a tree. Then, several hours later, 
Charlie Lawson shot himself. This did not go unnoticed. By then, the family's bodies had been discovered and word had already spread far enough that people were beginning to gather on the property. Upon hearing the shot, Arthur Lawson and a police officer ran into the woods to discover Charlie's remains. On his body, two notes were found, written on the back of tobacco auction receipts. One read, trouble can cause, and the other simply, nobody to blame. It was not an easy feat to transport the bodies of the Lawson family to the nearest funeral home. The harsh winter snow had left the steep hill where the Lawson cabin sat difficult to traverse, so special care had to be taken. Nearby family members, friends, and police deputies borrowed bedsheets to wrap around them, and carefully each person was brought down the hill on a makeshift sled to the main road where hearses awaited. They were first taken to a funeral home in Walnut Cove, but it was quickly realized that the establishment was far too small to accommodate the autopsy and embalming of eight bodies at one time. So they were moved again, this time to Madison, North Carolina, where they were brought to the larger Yelton Funeral Parlor, located on the second floor above the Penn Hardware Company. Dr. C.J. Helsebeck, the Stokes County Coroner, provided over the autopsies on Christmas night. He was assisted by Dr. Spotswood Taylor, an intern at Johns Hopkins Medical Center in Baltimore, Maryland. Little information about these autopsies is exceedingly noteworthy, except that Dr. Helsebeck removed Charlie Lawson's brain for examination, as at some point it was decided that a more in-depth analysis of the brain should be completed. So Dr. Taylor transported it in a jar of formaldehyde to Johns Hopkins. Notably, initial autopsy reports said that Lawson's brain was considered relatively small and that a portion of the center of the organ seemed underdeveloped, but otherwise showed no significant abnormalities. Then, on December 27, 1929, huge crowds gathered around the funeral home, lining West Murphy Street as the family's caskets were transported in a line of five hearses. They were buried in the Browder Family Cemetery in Germantown, North Carolina. Newspapers claimed that upwards of 5,000 people came out to see the row of seven caskets, which were laid out side by side in a single open grave dug by family and friends. Chillingly, four-month-old Mary Lou was not given a casket of her own, but was instead laid to rest nestled in her mother's arms. As for Charlie Lawson, he was buried in the same grave as the family he had killed, and together they share a single large headstone with the inscription, Not now, but in the coming years, it will be a better land. We'll understand the meaning of our tears, and then sometime we'll understand. It wasn't long after the burials that Charlie's brother, Marion, decided to take advantage of the massive public interest surrounding the tragedy. So he opened the murder site as a tourist attraction. For curious and gawking visitors, a 25-cent admission fee allowed access to the Lawson family cabin on Brook Cove Road, which had been left as disheveled and bloodstained as it had been on that Christmas day
It was said the gruesome state of the home was left for authenticity's sake, even going so far as to leave a cake baked by Marie on Christmas morning on the table of the kitchen, open to the cabin's visitors, some of whom picked off raisins from it as a morbid souvenir of their visit. Marion Lawson defended his decision to open the home, claiming that the funds raised would help the now orphaned Arthur in settling the mortgage on the farm. But it is unknown how much money was made or if those funds were used on the child's behalf. Exactly how long the site remained open as a tourist attraction is now disputed, with research offering only a vague range between several and many years. Eventually, though, it did come to an end, and the cabin was ultimately demolished. The motive behind Charlie Lawson's massacre of his family became a source of speculation. And stunned over the murders that had occurred, rumors quickly ran rampant throughout the community. One claimed that Charlie may not have killed his family at all, and that the whole thing was set up to silence him after witnessing something by an organized crime family. So for years, friends and family grappled with trying to find any kind of logical reason to explain the vicious crime. Some theorized that Charlie's mental state may have been altered as the result of a head injury he had sustained months before. Although the autopsies and tests showed no physical abnormalities to suggest something of the sort, historical accounts found in the work The Meaning of Our Tears by Trudy J. Smith suggests that prior to the murders, Charlie Lawson had been seen behaving erratically and out of character, even complaining to his doctor about severe headaches and insomnia. In 1990, 61 years after Charlie Lawson killed his family, Smith made a new claim as for the motive. In her book, White Christmas, Bloody Christmas, she theorizes that Charlie may have been sexually abusing his eldest daughter, Marie, and Marie had become pregnant. The exact origin of this theory is somewhat murky, as Smith claims it came from an anonymous source who heard the rumor while on a tour of the Lawson home not long after the murders took place. Smith also relates that just before the book was set to be published, she received a call from Stella Lawson, a family member who Smith had interviewed. Stella said that as a child, she remembered overhearing Fanny Lawson's sisters-in-law and aunts, including Stella's own mother, discussing how Fanny had confided in them about her concern about a, quote, incestuous relationship between her husband and Marie. Given that Stella's mother had died in 1928, it would be assumed that if Fanny was suspicious or aware of something happening, it would have been for at least a year before the murders took place. In Smith's follow-up book, The Meaning of Our Tears, published in 2006, she expounded on this theory. A close friend of Marie named Ella May had come forward and disclosed a private conversation that she and Marie had had just weeks before that Christmas in 1929. This conversation included Marie confiding in her friend that she was in fact pregnant and that Charlie was the father. Ella May also claimed that Marie said her parents were aware of her condition. Unfortunately, the autopsy report that had been completed following Marie's death did not indicate any signs of Marie's pregnancy, so this chilling theory is primarily based on hearsay. 
Smith also interviewed another close friend of the Lawsons, Hill Hampton. Hampton spoke of how he knew there were serious problems within the Lawson family, but he refused to go further with specific details. We likely will never know Charlie Lawson's true motive for committing the murders, but additional questions also remain. First, was the event premeditated or spontaneous? The expensive outing into town before Christmas and family portrait were obviously seen by many as evidence of premeditation. Secondly, why did Arthur survive? Had Charlie Lawson purposefully sent his son away because he knew it would be easier to kill the rest of his family if his son was not there to intervene? Ultimately, the story of the Lawson family will continue to be shrouded in mystery and filled with unanswerable questions. Though gone, the Lawsons are certainly not forgotten. Today, in historic downtown Madison, North Carolina, the second floor of the building that once housed the funeral home where the Lawson family were embalmed is now a museum in their honor, featuring the rooms and memorabilia from the mortuary service. Even the elevator used to transport the Lawson bodies is still functional in the 1908 brick building. But most of all, their story continues to be told in the song written by Walter Kidd Smith, which has since been recorded by numerous artists over the years, from the Stanley Brothers to Doc Watson and numerous bluegrass and Americana artists, allowing the chilling story to be told over and over again. My name is Brandon Schecksnyder, and you've been listening to Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is an independently released podcast written and produced by Brandon and Brianne Schecksnyder. For special access to members-only content, including access to the series Southern Gothic, The Monsters, as well as updates and links to our social media, visit southerngothicmedia.com today. Lucky Lady Shacks.